Okay, so this video is going to be a bit different. This is the first episode of Table Talk that I've done with someone that isn't one of my friends. And I actually did it on video chat. The person that I interviewed today is an amazing YouTuber called Jay Foreman. He has over 660,000 subscribers and he has been one of my favourite YouTubers for a long, long time. So after many emails, I managed to get a video call with him. We spoke about his YouTube career, we spoke about stand-up comedy, we spoke about Matt Lucas, Tom Scott, Matt Gray, Jeff Marshall, throwing all the names out there. And we also spoke about God and religion. And it was a really good chat, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. So, please enjoy. First of all, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. It means You're a lot. You're welcome, thank you for having um, me. It's, it's great to have you on. Um, before we get into that, I just wanted to um, kind of start this thing. To people that watch my YouTube channel, who are you, basically? Oh, I thought you were talking to the people that watch your YouTube channels. <laughs> no, you. <laughs> oh, you mean me? My name yeah. is Jay Foreman. Hello. I have a YouTube channel which is very silly educational videos. So I do videos about uh, mostly town planning, geography, politics, and that, that sort of a thing. There you go. Perfect. I, I mean, I, I just wanted to say as well, I've been watching your channel for around, I'd say, about three years. And oh, thank you very much. You have the most professional content on YouTube I've ever seen. Wow. Like, like have you ever worked for the BBC? No, they, um, they called me a, a couple of years ago and said, would I like to do a video for them? And um, it wasn't something where I was allowed to write anything. I basically just sort of turned up and read some auto cue. Oh, right. And um, it wasn't my usual style. When, when they finally uploaded the video, um, some people said, it, is this the real Jay Foreman? Because it doesn't look or sound like him. And it's because I was doing a presenting job rather than what I really like to do is like a, a research and writing and editing job. So um, the answer is yes, but... Eh. Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean with that. I mean, it, it, do you do a lot of the research yourself? When it's my own videos, yeah. So every series I do, I have somebody else that I work with for the writing. So when it was Politics Unboring, I was working with my friend Liam. Uh, Unfinished London, I work with my friend Paul. And Matt Men, I work with uh, Mark Cooper-Jones, who he's actually in the show and you can see him. So it's always a lot more fun when you've got somebody else to help with, you know, the uh, coming up with ideas, making each other laugh, doing the research. Um, so yeah, I, I've usually got somebody else helping me. You know how like, it, it, it's quite obvious that your YouTube videos have quite a big gap between some of them. And I was wondering, does that affect, like, obviously it's, um, it's easy to say that you spent, you put more time into them and they're higher quality, but does that actually affect the amount of sort of views you get? And well, I don't know because it? it's hard to, I mean, the only way for me to get a proper definitive answer is for me to have two different universes. And in one of them, I do exactly what I'm doing now. And in the yeah. other one, I upload a lot more videos, like one a week, like a lot of other creators are able to do and then see how that compares. Um, I think the reason that my videos take such a long time is because uh, I don't, I suppose I don't make them like most YouTube creators where I, every single word I say is scripted and it's always, it takes a really long time to do the research and the writing and filming often involves like, you know, dozens of locations. So I don't think it's really possible for me to go any faster. That and the fact that um, I'm not really technically a full-time YouTuber. I also work as a comedian. So there's always something to sort of keep me busy. Like at the moment I'm on a, well, because of lockdown, I'm not doing gigs, but technically I'm still in the middle of my UK tour. So it always takes longer between my videos than yeah. a lot of other YouTube people. I mean, you do, you do a lot of live stuff, don't you? No, I like it's my job. Well, I, the thing is, I am primarily a comedian and I do, um, I do stand up and I do these days a lot of shows for children. Um, and then when I'm not doing that, I'm working on my YouTube channel. Like slowly YouTube is starting to take over quite a bit, but I am still technically um, uh, two jobs McGee. Have you, have I don't you know found... where McGee came from. It felt right. <laughs> it, it works. Let's run with it. So with the whole lockdown thing, obviously we're having to do a video link and all that stuff, everything is completely different. Have you found that that's kind of changed your motivations and what you do? Well, in terms of filming, obviously uh, the filming is all on hold, but I was incredibly lucky because we, um, I spend very little of my year filming. It's, you know, it tends to be short bursts of about a week or two weeks during which we're filming every day. And then the entire rest of the year, I'm just sat at home on my laptop editing. So it so happens we managed to get our filming schedule, we filmed, finished the day before the lockdown was announced wow. which was unbelievably lucky both because it meant we got all of our footage in the can and it also meant that as soon as lockdown was announced i had nothing else to do with my time but stay home 
and sit in front of my laptop and get all the editing done. So I couldn't have asked for a better timing for this otherwise absolutely really awful and boring yeah. and stressful and frustrating and very tragic thing that's happening. Yeah. As I mean, a, when it comes to the next set of videos, uh, again, Mark and I are very lucky that we're on lockdown because it means we can do the writing now, which we might not otherwise have had time for. You know, he'd have been doing his job and I'd have been doing my uh, comedy shows. However, we don't know when lockdown is going to finish. And so we don't know when the hell we're going to be able to start filming the next series of Mat Men. Hmm. So it's, it's like, like all things, I guess. It swings and roundabouts. You said you did all that recording just before and you just put out like two new videos, didn't you? And that, I mean, they were, I've, those two new videos you put out, I have one burning question. First of all, I really, I really loved them. They were amazing. And the question is, how do you know Matt Lucas? I don't know him. I'll tell you what happened. He, um, uh, some months ago, let me try and remember which way around it was. Um, oh yeah. So it started, I sent a tweet. This, okay. It starts three years ago. I sent a tweet saying that I just read his autobiography and I said, speaking as a Jewish comedian who grew up in Stanmore and used to get the 340 bus, I really enjoyed Matt Lucas's autobiography. What I was trying to point out there was that I had a very, very similar upbringing to his. I grew up in very, very, you know, just around the corner from him. And he saw the tweet and retweeted it. And I said, oh, now I've got your attention. Can I please uh, show you this? This is a film that I made about the unfinished Northern Line in Edgware, which is where we both grew up. So would you like this, Mr. Matt Lucas, sir? And amazingly, he did see it and he liked it and shared it. And then he started following me on Twitter. And then I, some years later, I thought to myself, I'd really like Matt Lucas in my next video. I mean, what could the harm be? Since I know he already has seen one of my videos, what would the harm be if I just send him a DM and ask him, would you like to be in, in the show? And uh, wouldn't you know, he said yes. And I was aghast, couldn't believe it, because I've been a huge fan of his for, you know, it's Matt Lucas, it's George yeah. Dawes. So we dropped everything and made sure that our schedule could fit around him just for that 10 seconds of, of dialogue that he did. It was worth he it. was very nice. He's a lovely man. Uh, and, and there you go. That's how it happened. Me being an 18 year old guy who makes YouTube videos and has like 200 subscribers, you agreeing to come on this is sort of a similar Matt Lucas thing <laughs> for me. I wonder what it is for Matt Lucas. What's his equivalent? <laughs> you go up the, the queen. How many years they've been around? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what, who's the most, I'd say the most famous person, but what's the most unreal thing you've got out of doing your, doing your job? Oh, I think that is the one, uh, working with Matt yeah. Lucas. And I think more than just working with him, I was sort of, uh, for those short 10 minutes, I was directing him. I was telling him what to do. Like, this is a man who's, I've been following his career for decades. And, you know, there I was standing behind the camera saying, that was great, but let's have it again, pace here. I'm telling Matt Lucas, but that I think... If that doesn't make me happy, I guess nothing will. I think that is probably yeah. the most the most professional I've ever felt doing this. Just just for those those few hours, you were just one above Matt Lucas. Then... For it, it was about thirty seconds during which the status flipped. Yeah. Uh, apart from that, yes. I mean, I yeah, I I genuinely really enjoyed the videos. So they were great. Oh, oh, thank many, you. How many people do you have working on just one video? Well. Um, when we're writing, it's me and my friend Paul. We've been doing it from the beginning. Um, and I, I write the, I think he'd you know, be happy to admit that I write the lion's share of it, but I can't really do it without him. I've always got Paul there to bounce the ideas off and he helps me out with the research, which I think he's a lot better at than I am. Um, but it's just the two of us. And then with the editing, it's just the one of me. Um, and then with the filming, for that week, we get the help of anyone that we can. So we had, there's a third guy, a guy called Oz, who's a friend of Paul's, used to work with him, who does the camera stuff with us. Um, sometimes Paul and I have done videos where it's just us two and there's no one helping us. Um, and my partner Jade, who, um, uh, has been just wonderful helping out. She's been helping with the writing, with the research, with the prop making, which she actually does in her job as a, um, stage manager for theater. So yeah, I've always got as many people helping as I can, but the short answer with the edit is, is just me. Just, just, you just edit yourself. Yeah. I occasionally, ah, well, I say that oh. I, um, I often, if there's something that I can't do, I will, and if it's a job that I think someone with better skills or software could do in about 10 minutes, I'll go on Twitter and I'll say, is there anyone out there mm -hmm. who's better at I am than Photoshop, you know, just to change the color of this, or can you tilt this for me, or, you know, make a quick graphic for me. And then just a couple of times, it's been a job that actually requires a professional VFX artist, and I've actually got someone doing proper VFX for me now, who I pay the proper rate. But, you know, in general, 
I do it all myself and I get only help when there's little bits I can't do and that's why it takes me such a long time. But editing is by far my favorite part of the process because it's, um, I think the best way I can put it is it's like literally controlling time. Yeah. And being a massive control freak like I am, there's nothing more satisfying than having control of everything on the screen and taking your time and really like honing in a, in a bit too much detail. I do enjoy doing that. I mean, you, because you're a comedian, I guess, obviously I'm not, I'm not professional. But not with that attitude. Comedy, comedy is like a lot of it is timing, and I guess with editing you can fix the timing where it went wrong and really make it funny in the edit. Yes, you, you can. You, you can use lot. it to. Yes, you can use it to retell a story. You can make something that didn't happen actually happen, and we like to throw in a few special effects, like you know, teleporting or shape shifting, and I think that's part of why I enjoy it so much. And as for the timing, I once did a collaboration with Jeff Marshall, who's like my sort of YouTube friend slash nemesis, yeah. uh, who makes similar videos. Yeah. And um, there was a time when I was at his place and we were editing a video that we'd worked on together. And um, I was sort of backseat editing. He was the one sat at the controls and I was standing behind him. And I was saying things like, oh no, hang on, adjust that, move that one frame to the left, one frame to the right. And he couldn't believe it. He's like, what do you mean one frame? That's not gonna make a difference. I was like, yes, it will. Yes, it absolutely will, because some jokes require precision timing. And I guess that shows how anal I am and how much I actually do care about the timing and how, how important I think the timing is. I, I can, yeah, you can definitely see that in the videos. Like, I... It's also why I never do anything unscripted, you know, apart from you know, the occasional stuff like mm. this. But everything on my channel has to be scripted because I like to have the control over it, whether it means spending months doing loads of rewrites, making sure that it's as well phrased as possible, or you know, being able to do it 17 times and pick the best take. And then having done that, I'll often do some time remapping in just like the bits between words. Like if I do a voiceover, very often there'll be a cut halfway through a word that you can't hear unless you, you know, properly slow it down and zoom in. But it's all because I'm this terrible control freak. Is, is that hard work sometimes or is it, is it fun for you? It's loads of fun. I mean, it's long work. It takes a really long time. It's like my usual process, if I record a voiceover, I'll go in the cupboard under the stairs with cushions and I'll just say each tiny, tiny little bit of the line over and over and over again. And then it'll take me the rest of the day to sort of go through it and cut it together using the best bits of words. So it's very rare that you'll hear a whole sentence where I said the whole thing all the way through. I sometimes actually on purpose take advantage of that. So there's quite a few times in, uh, on my series on YouTube where I'll deliver an impossibly long sentence where there's no breath. And that's on purpose. And I sometimes like, I'll make a joke of it. Like I'll have, um, we, I did an advert once. I think it was only the second advert I ever did where the dialogue was all done in one breath, cutting between two different versions of me. And I did that just to see if it was possible. It's, it's stuff like that that sets you apart, I guess. Oh, thank you. One thing I was, I was wondering as well, a lot, obviously a lot of your content is based in or around London. A lot of it is about London. What is it about London that interests you that much that you need that you research that much? It's two things. First of all, the fact that it is, in in my opinion, the most fascinating city in the world. The fact that I think nowhere like London does as good a combining of the ancient and the modern. And you know, London is in terms of the world scale for enormous big mega cities. It's not that big. However, it's by far the biggest city in Western Europe. It's a thrillingly fascinating city and there are so many different stories you can tell about it. So that's reason number one. And reason number two is I live here. It's just a lot easier just to make yeah. videos about the city that I already live in. Oh, hi, didn't see you there. If you're enjoying the video, why not subscribe to me, Craig Baker Photography, for more interviews, podcasts, and street photography. Okay, back to the video. Where are you based, I... by the way? Are you uh, um, near London? I'm uh, sorry. Sorry if I can't speak. I can normally speak. I'm just like, I'm kind of nervous for this. That's all right. I'm, I'm nervous it's too. Just, I'm, I'm just in the nervous. garden. I've never done a podcast in my garden before. What if, yeah, I don't I've, know, what if some spiders come along? I've never done a podcast to a laptop, to a, to a man. Never we're all having to get used to doing things to laptops that we're, you know, not yeah. normally used to doing. That sounds what, with all, weird. all this? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm based in East London. Do you know Dagenham? Yes. I, mean, I, I don't know it intimately, yeah. but I, I know where it is. Yeah. Actually, I've got a better knowledge now of where different bits of London are than ever before, because I spent the last few months staring at maps of London for the, for the edit job. You did that, um, that video, didn't you? The one where you go on stage and you sang every tube station? Yeah, this is um, uh, a song that I wrote, which is a long time ago now, uh, as part of my live yeah. act, where I sing every tube station in three and a half minutes. Um, 
so the the other guy, Jeff Marshall, that I was that I mentioned a lot, he um, in those days, as well as doing stuff on YouTube, he used to make a living by filming people's shows at the Edinburgh Fringe. And he came to film my show and he didn't know that I had a song that was a list of every tube station. And I knew that he'd lose his shit. Oh, by the yeah. way, am I allowed to swear on your podcast? Yeah, go for it, yeah. That he'd lose his shit if he, um, if he saw me do that song. So it was great fun to watch his reaction. He was wheezing and like sort of pacing up and down the back of the room with this camera while I was singing the tube song. So yeah, he, achievement he unlocked. Loved it. Loved it. <laughs> he was involved. He, so he came and shot the um, uh, version of me doing it at my Edinburgh show. I'm not sure what actually happened to that footage, but he then uh, helped me to film the actual, the music video that became the video on YouTube of the Every Tube Station song. Yeah. This is a long time ago now. This is 2013. I was, I was also wondering how many people, how many people that you talk to request that you do that, that you sing a song and then do the one syllable out of sync? Annoyingly oh, quite a lot. I mean, it's yeah. a, it's a one-off trick that I do sometimes in my live show where like uh, between songs I say, oh, uh, here's a little trick I can do. And I play a song, one syllable delay. And um, people now sort of, because it's a party piece I do, they often request that I do it to other songs. Um, whether it's when I'm doing live streams or they, they don't ask at gigs. I think when they're actually at shows, they do very well to just sit there and watch what I'm going to do. But you know, if I am, yeah. um, if, if I'm doing a live stream and people type request, then that comes up quite a lot. I mean, is it, it must be quite annoying, right? Not really, no. I mean, um, it would be annoying if I was duty bound to listen to every single one of them and had to do it. But I've got the luxury of, uh, you know, someone could yeah. ask me, hey, can you sing uh, the theme from Thomas the Tank Engine, one syllable delay? And I can just say, no. This is something I've been genuinely wanting to know for years now. And I think that of all the people, maybe you can answer it. Uh oh, pressure's on. Is Matt Gray always that happy? Yeah, I've never seen him unhappy. I, I've known Matt Gray for a long time because um, we were all at York University together. So before he and Tom Scott became these YouTube things, I, I already knew them. Um, as far as I know, yeah, that is his full-time uh, full face. He always seems happy. Yeah. He's always laughing and always... Smiling. Quite enviable, yeah. Yeah, I want, I want to be that one day. I guess, but, yeah. if we're being realistic, he must get sad in real life because everybody does. And I bet when he's sad, he looks really sad. That is deep. Anyway. Right, so God. God, yes. <laughs> we, I forgot <laughs> this. When you, so I should make clear, um, I had an email from you. In fact, it's so, it's so funny. I'm going to find the email and read out what you said, if that's all right with you. Yeah, go for it. Um, the email said, for those watching at home, um, I'd love to have you on as a guest and have a chat. It can be about YouTube, Bolshevik history, or the existence of a God. And uh, that was it. Those were my options. <laughs> like, that's such a wonderfully three specific and entirely unrelated things. Um, I've chosen um, to have a discussion about the existence or non-existence of a God, because I think that's the one that I'm most comfortable having a long chat about since I don't really... What was the second one again? The, the what empire? The Bolshevik, Bolshevik history. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I found myself wondering what the word Bolshevik even means. So that's, that's not my area of expertise. Um, I'll, I'll choose the theology topic. I mean, you, you said, you replied straight away and said you're a passionate humanist. Yes. So I think that I, might help me if, if we're going to have a discussion. It's nice to have a point of view to start from. Yeah, I'd like to know you, what's, like, what's your definition of that word? Because there's a lot of different definitions. Well, I mean, it's, it should be quite straightforward. Basically, I'm an atheist, which means I don't think there's a God. Um, but humanist seems to be like a, a nicer word for it because in the last few years, the word atheist has developed this sort of reputation that sounds similar to Jobsworth or Killjoy or, you mm. know, nerd on Twitter that says, actually, I think you'll find. Um, and it's a pity. Whereas humanist simply means you do believe in people that should be nice to each other and you do believe that people should be remembered after they die and you do like a bit of ceremony when it comes to weddings and funerals, but you also don't believe in anything supernatural. So I guess that's the definition of what I believe or indeed don't believe. I am, I am not religious in the slightest. I, I do not believe there is a God. And yet the word atheist, unfortunately, has got a bad reputation, which is a pity because I am an atheist and proud to be one. But I think prouder to be a humanist. Were you, Does that make were sense? You, yeah, definitely. Were you, were you raised that way or is this something you've come to believe? 
I was raised Jewish um, and my family is Jewish and we still do a lot of Jewish traditions that I'm very fond of. So um, were it not for COVID-19, my whole extended family would have met for Passover. And it's my favorite time of year. It's like a Jewish Thanksgiving. We've got a really large family. And the fact that there's some sort of ritual to it, the fact that we all read from the ancient books and we take turns, it's like a big classroom that the whole family can have fun disrupting. And then every Friday night, my closer family get together and we have chicken soup and challah. And it's, I love these things. I don't think there's a God, but I think those things are nice. So do you think that it's, it's, it's entirely possible that these sort of religious rituals and like written scriptures and that is entirely from people and for people and there's nothing above Control, that's yeah. that's exactly what I believe. Yeah, I think um, right. if you know what it's like to look at religions that either aren't yours or haven't existed in a few hundred years, you can look at religions that still exist in exactly the same way. I basically, I think you and I feel the same way about the ancient Greek gods um, of Zeus and so on. And uh, I, I mean, I haven't actually asked what your point of view about all this is, but um, I feel about all religions, including the one I was brought up with, I feel the same about that one as I do about the religions that have come and gone. I, you know, there is, um, you can see how religions get started and how they get changed and passed on. And it's, you know, they, they grow and evolve and change just like languages, just like all, if you'll forgive the expression, memes. Um, I don't think that means there's such thing as a higher power. And more important than that, I think you can, in the absence of an existence in a higher power, you can still have a wonderful life and you can still be a good person and still believe in yeah. things. I mean, I... My my girlfriend is a Peace Church Christian, and before I met her, I used to think that, like, the, I used to think the idea of church is something where people go and they praise to God, and then they leave. But since like meeting her and going to church with her, because I was like full on atheist before I met her, mm. and through going to church and stuff like that, I've I've sort of come to think that or realize even that places like churches and stuff like that, places of worship, it, it really, a lot of the time it isn't about worshipping someone higher. A lot, a lot of the time it's just about a community and it's sort of like a... Oh, absolutely. Group. I mean, the, the advantages of people who, you know, come together and pray together and do these things in a community, helping each other, the advantages are enormous. And you can, mm. I think an amazing parallel you can see, like why people come together and do religious things is in every Thursday at 8 p.m. when we have our clap for our carers. I think yeah. it's alarmingly similar to what religion is. Yeah. We don't know how else we can help. We don't want to be seen not doing it. And it's for yeah. a good higher cause. You know, the NHS, what a wonderful thing to believe in and support and help and want to do well. And mm -hmm. so what can you do? You clap. You clap as loud as you can. And that's, okay. that's, that's very, very, thing. very similar to how religions get started. Yeah, it does, if it doesn't cost anything. Why not? Exactly. And it's not as if we've got anything else to do. Yeah. No do one you... wants to be the one family that's not seen on the street clapping because everybody knows you're in. You've got nothing yeah. else to do. It's 8 p.m. You're not having any Zoom meetings. Do you think, I mean, I'm not going to go into detail, but what, do you, what are your views on essentially, is it worth it? Because you can look back at like stuff like the English Civil War when like thousands of people were killed over the church. And then you can look at someone who's lost a family member and finds like peace in God. Do you think overall it's kind of worth religion? You're asking me, is, a, is religion a thing worth happening and would the world be better if we were rid of it? Is that your question? Yeah, I mean, do you think it's essentially a good thing that benefits us or does well, it cause more harm than division? I mean, not a lot of people like my answer because my answer is no. I, I don't think we are better off for having religion. Um, I think if people were allowed to, um, to give it a lot of thought, to be dismissive of it, and not to be so automatically respecting of people's beliefs, perhaps it would be a better place. Perhaps we'd get more done. But the thing is, it's difficult to square that with being nice. Because there's these two different opinions I hold, and one of them is that religion makes otherwise sensible people do silly things. And at the same time, I also believe that we should let people do things that are harmless, and we should all try to be nice. And sometimes squaring those two is difficult. It's because it's very hard to know whether it's the right thing to do to let people do things that harm their children's education. I mean, on the one hand, if people want to spend their Sunday gathering in buildings and praying to a God that you don't believe in yourself, there's no harm in that. 
Yeah. But when you tell kids that they can't learn scientific truth, that they can't learn about sex and relationships, or that they can't show their face, or that they, in some yeah. countries, can't go to school or drive, and so on and so on, you've got to draw the line somewhere. And if you want to make things incredibly simple and ask me, do I think religion in general is a good thing for the world in general? My answer in general is no. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I kind of, I've been thinking that a lot of religions, they kind of say, basically every religion has the mantra of respect people and have tolerance. But I feel like it's kind of, it's difficult when every religion says be tolerant of other people but then everyone has a different label so it's like a christian and like a muslim both both the religions say respect each other but then when you're so, you're something different to me there's kind of a, a difference in that exactly you can ask people officially it says here in the rules that you're supposed to respect each other but realistically what's really going to happen when you spend the rest of the time saying that these people are wrong and they're all going to hell you should still respect them but by the way the vast majority of our message is these people are different, you know. So that's why I come to my overall rather a rather oversimplified conclusion that it's not a good thing overall. I mean, yeah, it's good. It's really it's good to have an actual atheist or humanist, or whatever you want to say, that can actually back up their point. Is that a lot of people can't? I th well, this is the weird thing. I think religion uniquely has the ability to completely envelop someone's way of thinking and that includes yeah. if you're an atheist you know i'm happy to admit that i will sometimes sort of refuse to listen if someone uh, uh you know approaches with an argument and i immediately think well you're bound to say whatever you're going to say because you're extremely religious and i'm not going to listen to you but you know it's religion uniquely makes people very sort of locked into their own positions and that's yeah. why i think it's good to be able to have discussions like this i used to have discussions like this quite often with my dad growing up because uh, he was a religious Jew and I was an atheist and we would often have bitter arguments about whether or not religion was a good thing or whether there was a God. And I sort of came to realize when I was older that these arguments usually are not worth having because people tend to be very dyed in the wool with their beliefs. So it's these days quite rare and fun to have a discussion like this with someone whose views are different from mine. And I think the world will be a much nicer place if we all listen to each other more. Because there's a lot that people who believe in God can tell me that I wouldn't necessarily have considered. One of the best arguments I heard that I find it very hard to come back from, um, if I say that religion is bad for the world, a religious person once said to me, that's like saying food is bad for you. You know, look at people that overeat, people that are overweight and they eat terrible things all the time and they have to go to hospital because they're eating too much food and eating the wrong food. Is the solution that you ban food? Or is the solution that they just eat healthy things? And in that analogy, mm. the Westboro Baptist Church and the fundamentalists who kill people are the overeaters. And going to church on Sunday and coming home and carrying on with your life is a nice, healthy salad. I couldn't really think of an argument against that. And there's a good example yeah. of even people whose views I don't agree with have something for, for me to listen to. That is really interesting, yeah. I mean, I my kind of main view is that a, a lot of people say there's when you when you think of a god you think of some sort of omnipresent force from above and a lot of people think of one singular vision like man person whatever but my my view to that is kind of that it's not a sort of external force and that it's an internal force so for example the analogy that i always use is when you're like on the train or walking down the street or something and you see a homeless person asking for money. If you give them money, it doesn't benefit you at all. It doesn't help you survive. It doesn't give you a one up. It, it won't. A lot of the time, people seeing it won't care. So why would you do it? Like, why does it feel good to be kind? And I feel like that that good feeling that comes from being kindness, it can't be. It can't be like a. If you believe in Darwinism, you can't. Put them things together I don't think that's you like actually can um there is an evolutionary argument like um our species if you think of it from the point of think of it from the point of view of the gene the if you'll forgive the often used phrase the selfish gene um if there is an altruism gene something in all of us that wants to be kind and help people out and get that thrill that buzz when you give money to a homeless person the species and therefore the gene will benefit so there's actually a rather straightforward 
very elegant way of explaining, yes, there is a Darwinian explanation for why we are nice to each other. But how, how would that benefit you to survive personally? It benefits the species. It benefits society. Our society is more likely to thrive and, uh, frankly, reproduce for longer if we have an innate wish to help each other out, to a wish to be nice and to be seen to be nice. You know, that little buzz, that little thrill you get from helping someone that you might say as spiritual, I think that's a lazy interpretation. I think a more realistic reason why that feels good is because there's a rather simple Darwinian explanation. It helps the species from the point of view of the selfish, not individual, but the selfish gene. You have to benefit all of society. If for exactly the same reason that bees have massive suicide missions, which I didn't really explain very well, but you know, we help the entire species and humans are just like that. Nearly okay. everything can be explained that way if you wanted to. Even the fact that we, we look at a beautiful landscape and we think this is such a wonderful, beautiful thing to look at. Does that prove there might be a God? Well, no, what it actually proves is humans like places with running water and greenery because it's a good, important thing to live yeah. there. You are yeah. more likely to reproduce if you live in a comfortable environment. You know, you can explain a lot of these things Darwinianly if you want to. Do you think that if you're saying that doing a good deed and feeling good about it can be Darwinian, would you also say the opposite for like guilt and that's that kind of stuff? What do you mean? The opposite you, for guilt? Like if you, if you do something bad to someone or something and you feel a remorse for that, even though it wouldn't affect you. If you say that oh, is yeah. the same part. Absolutely. That's exactly the same. I mean, think about it. What kind of a society would we be if we all stole from each other and kicked each other in the nuts and never felt bad about it? Feeling bad about doing something bad is a very helpful evolutionary trait. So are you, are you saying that people are sort of born in their DNA with a part of sort of, I, 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 don't, I don't want to use the word, but are people born with a bit of socialism? Hmm. Socialism is a strong word for it, but I think we're certainly <laughs> born with altruism. I think everyone is, you know, naturally wants to be good. I mean, a big part of it has to be taught. You know, if you don't bring a kid up properly, they'll be an asshole. But, you know, the vast, vast majority of good people who do good, lovely, kind, charitable, nice, kind things, they don't do it because they're scared of going to hell or because they're trying to get to heaven. They do it because they actually are nice. And there is an innate want to be nice for most people. I think that's how we got here today. Not with religion, but by actually being nice. Some people yeah. are nicer than others, of course, but I don't think religion plays a huge part. You'll notice that a lot of people in prisons tend to be religious, you know, people who have been uh, taken by temptation. I, there is a very weak correlation indeed between religious and nice and kind. The, the, the prison thing. Do you not think a lot of people, a lot of people that go into prison doing bad, doing bad things, a lot of them go in atheist and come out religious. Do you think that the idea of religion can help save some people from... It can do. I mean, I met someone when I was at uni, a guy in the first year who uh, apparently when he was younger, when he was a teenager, he was a very violent man. Is this Tom very Scott? sort of, you know, quick to anger. No, oh. this is somebody else. Oh. Uh, he was very quick to anger, very violent. And then he discovered Jesus with a plumb. He became a real Christian, you know, like he sort of, you know, took time out to pray all the time. You know, even the other members of the Christian Union, the, you know, religious society at York Uni thought he was a bit too far. <laughs> and I mean, he was still very intense, but he wasn't doing as much violence. So there's just one example of how religion can be a savior for some people. I don't think it's what the whole world needs, but I mean, yes, there's plenty of anecdotes, plenty of people who do well out of religion, but that doesn't mean it's for everyone. And that certainly doesn't mean it's true. Yeah, it's definitely a good viewpoint, yeah. It's okay. always fun to have a, because every time I've done one of these podcasts for the last few weeks and months, it's been about YouTube or, or music or comedy. Uh, so this is a nice, refreshing bit of a brain exercise. Well, speaking I might of watch, that, I might watch it back after and go, oh dear, did I say that? I know, regardless of what you just said, do you have anything you'd like to sort of promote or any to direct people anywhere? Uh, yep, yeah, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Jay Foreman, and I've also got my YouTube channel, which is my name, Jay Foreman, uh, and I've got a Patreon and various other uh, things. If you Google me, you'll you'll find stuff. Your videos are very. I, I was I've always wondered how would you describe um, your sort of category of content or genre. I don't know. I mean, it's only recently I've had to put it in a category. Um, I guess 
they're documentaries, but they're made like comedies. They're comedy documentaries, uh, ed edutainment, if, if you'll pardon the uh, awful phrasing. I don't know. It doesn't really it doesn't really have a name. You can call it what you want, as long as people sure. watch. Yeah, sure. Just like BBC Gone Rogue. Yeah. yeah, why not? There you go. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure being here. I will probably, yeah, sleep and then edit this. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, nice I'll to speak it. to you. I'll be off then. I'm going to go. Oh, I'm on 17% uh, battery, so I'll be off. Nice to talk okay. to you and uh, let me know if you Probably. need anything else from me. Thank you. You too. Have a great day. Cheers. You too. Bye. Cheers.